Hello. Oh. The box. Yeah, the box is really a poem about boxes. The box, you know, physical boxes, boxes that you put things in, metaphorical boxes, like the, the box of genre, the box of form, the box of structure, all these boxes in one box. So, uh, it's all boxes within a box. It's, it's about boxes. Uh, Simon Turner said Simon that Simon Turner, it... Simon Turner, Simon Turner. Simon Turner. Simon Turner, Simon Turner. Yes, yeah, Simon Turner says about this one, I'm entirely at a loss as to whether the iambic infelicities it's infected with and its awkward use of enjambment, Simon Turner, enjambment, are the result of a finely tuned paradis ear or are simply marks of poor workmanship. Iambic infelicities, I mean, I... Do you have a finely tuned paradist's ear? Uh, yeah, I don't know if I have a paradist's ear. I certainly haven't had either of my ears tuned for quite a while. Uh, which one is it? I, I think it's that one. It's, uh, just read it, you know, read it if you like it. Yeah, that's great. If you don't like it, don't... P pretend you like it for the purposes of the review. Yeah? Is that so much to ask? How do you excuse all these enjambments? Well, I excuse the enjambments by, um, you can see the shape of the poem on the page there. If I didn't use the enjambments, uh, the line would just carry on forever and you'd need a really, really, really wide book, uh, but also quite short. So, um, I don't know who would be able to print uh, paper the right shape, print on paper the right shape to um, accommodate a poem like that. Why is their use so awkward? I just think that they're fine. I mean, he, he complained particularly about um, the line, it has a history being on one line, and then of sorts being on the next line. I mean, I'm no expert on enjambment, but I think of sorts qualifies it has a history in such a way as making, uh, you know, the enjambment a viable choice there. Um, why does the box speak? The box speaks because um, I thought it would be interesting to uh, give the box a voice. <laughs> why? What's it for? Uh, I, I think it was right. Why, why have you done it? Why have you written this? Well, the box says, says three things. It says you can't see the fin for the infinite. That's fin as in what you would see at the end of a film, a fan, it should be pronounced, but the, the pun doesn't work if you pronounce it like that. It means the end. You can't see the ending for the, the infinite. Sort of like the wood for the trees, but um, not. Why have you written this poem? It also says, don't judge a frame by its painting, which is uh, something that a box might say. It works as a metaphor for the kind of presentation of the, the content, if you see what I mean. Why, why have I got to read it? It also says, I know, because I think boxes are pretty knowing. What, what is it? What is it about? <laughs> uh, a box is, is something that you put things in, quite simply. I don't think I can make it simpler than that. Torture porn. Torture porn. Torture. Uh, torture porn. Torture porn is a genre of uh, cinematic entertainment. Probably the less said about this, the better. It's been around since cinema started, probably, but... Um, it was particularly uh, talked about as a genre with the advent of such franchises as Hostel by Eli Roth, mentioned therein, uh, that director chap, and also the Saw films, none of which I've seen, actually. All of the lines are different lengths. But also you can, you can trace its origins back, certainly explicitly, to um, Wes Craven's The Last House on the Left, which is a sort of uh, jolly film about rape and violence that um, you shouldn't watch if you're trying to have a romantic evening in. I once found out to my uh, disadvantage, I suppose you might say. How do you excuse the violent sexual imagery? I excuse the uh, violent sexual imagery. I don't excuse it. Uh, I suppose, no. Yeah, no, I do. Uh, I suppose I excuse the violent sexual imagery uh, should such an occasion present itself for me to feel that I needed to do that by saying, please excuse the violent sexual imagery. Please is a little word, but it usually goes a long way. This one's very long. It is, it is long, it's not uh, just long, it's also quite wide, if you see that 
there. It takes up a lot of space. It's a, an ugly yeah, it's looking just, there's poem. too much writing. It's all over the page. And its content is ugly, so I felt that it should be an ugly, sprawling... Uh, like, sort of doing an autopsy on a giant spider and finding it was full of uh, trite rhymes and uh, lengthy sentences, often beginning with and. Is this even a poem? It is. I think it's a poem. It is a poem, yeah. Um, I, I, I think it's definitely a poem. It's, um, it's lots of words on the page and there are line breaks. It was the great Andrew Motion who so qualified the definition of a poem, so... Yeah, argue Do you him. think Fred West should be free? If you, if you want to, to argue with a poet. Do you think Fred West should be free? That anyone has heard of. Do you think Fred West should be free to... I didn't say free, Fred... I haven't finished. Do you think Fred West should be free to publish and create things, oh. film himself masturbating, call it art, screen it and charge a fee for entry? I didn't say... That's what you've said here. I didn't say Fred West. I said Fred West's, uh, meaning people of that ilk, uh, villains, uh, people uniformly agreed by the society from which they sprung to be bad things, uh, you know, murderers, uh, paedophiles, uh, pe people, rapists, uh, pe people who do the worst things that society um, thinks could be done by people. And I do think, uh, do I think that? Um, Probably, unless it contravenes the terms of their prison sentence. Although I do think people should be able to vote in prison. Uh, so I, I also think they should be able to draw, but probably not with pencils because they might stab someone. Or themselves. So, uh, with crayons, probably. Crayons, yes. Dead by Christmas. The dedication says, for Per Ingve Oyen. Dead by Christmas is a poem that actually came about purely uh, by stealing a title from a song, it was a song by the Murder City Devils, but it, I believe it was a cover version. There's a song called Dead by Christmas anyway, by some US punk act. Who's this about? And um, I thought, what if Dead by Christmas was actually a poem about the guy dead, the guy called Dead, who was once the lead singer of Norwegian black metal act Mayhem. This is the second reference to self-harm in one of your poems. The first was fictional autobiography. Um, the second, this one, is biography. Uh, written by Father Christmas. Father Christmas? Who was... Why Father Christmas? The only person I could think of with the surname Christmas. Apart from Nathan Christmas. Oh, that Christmas. And uh, I can't... I don't really know enough about Nathan Christmas. Who was a guy who uh, lived in a town I used to live in to know what sort of poem he would write about the deceased Norwegian black metal singer dead. Isn't this a bit gratuitous? Uh, I don't think the reference to self-harm is gratuitous because this is kind of biography. He did slash his wrists on stage earlier on in the poem um, All That Is Free when I made a reference to uh, carving my own name in blood on my arm. That probably was gratu gratuitous because I've never done that probably never would do How that. How do you excuse all the, the violent self-harm imagery? It was employed allegorically. Here, it is simply a, quite a matter-of-fact poem about the, the kind of guy that dead Per Ingve Olin, to use his real name. Is this a true story? Apparently was. Obviously I never met him. I only read second-hand sources in uh, books like Lords of Chaos by Michael Moynihan and someone with a Norwegian name. And uh, he seemed like a tragic guy, caught up in a, I don't know, the wrong circles. And the cat in the garden, he, ch he chases a cat around the garden in his pants. He did chase a cat around the garden in his pants. With a knife? With a knife. That was an anecdote from the aforementioned book, Lords of Chaos, which one of his former bandmates, or possibly one of the uh, members of the band Emperor, I can't remember, someone from a Norwegian black metal band recounted an anecdote about how Per Ingve Odin, also known as Dead, chased a cat around the garden in his pants. And I felt in a book trying to uh, reconcile the disconnect between art and commerce, it was important to include such an anecdote. How is it relevant? Uh, I don't know if he put a dead badger in a bag and put it out for Father Christmas, but he did use to inhale the scent of 
Possibly a dead crow, some sort of dead animal. Or a raccoon. Maybe an animal they only have in Norway. Is this is this a real thing? Is this based on a true story? Death Eater or something. From a paper bag before concerts because he wanted to have the scent of death about him and in his lungs for when he was singing, or as I put it here, vomiting his vocal charms. Because singing in Norwegian black metal, even if you are Swedish, is more of a kind of... <coughs> Or, um, uh, well, no, that's more death metal, isn't it? I mean, how do you excuse all the violent sexual imagery? <laughs> like that. Excuse me. Ah, the next poem. God, there are so many. Um, Clara. Clara. Uh, Clara. Clara is a, a poem ostensibly about a woman called Clara who I knew briefly while I was living in Prague and working as uh, an English teacher. She was one of my students. But really it is a poem about me, like uh, most, if not all of my poems are. Yes, another really long poem, really long. Yeah, it's, it's quite long and certainly there are stanzaic straight jackets in here, you know, it's, it's four uh, Four lines per stanza. Nobody, nobody's read this one. Nobody's read. Convoluted rhyme scheme. Didn't know when to stop it. Feel like it should have been longer. It's just, it's just really long, to be honest. Really, so long. Thing. I mean, there's so much to tell. Well, what? Why is it so long? But, um, you know, people only have so much patience these days, which is a shame, I think. So this is pure autobiography. I don't know if it's autobiography. Uh, I suppose it is. It, it, it's more kind of Bill Dung's Roman. Bill I Dung's Roman. I think that's how you say that. Bill Dung's Roman. Bill Dung's Roman. Is that a word? I, I'll say it a few different ways just in case I'm pronouncing it wrong. What does this have to tell us about Bill Dung's Roman? You. Alexander. Bill Dung's Roman. I mean, it's not a very interesting story. Bill Dung's Roman. I presume it's probably true. Bill Dung's Roman. It's one of those, anyway. It's, it's, it's kind of a portrait of uh, me as a younger me. Um, what does it have to tell us about art and commerce? Uh, I suppose it, it's, it's about it's about someone who wants to be an artist, someone who wants to be a poet in this case. Uh, although I'm also painting in the poem, as I, I am in several places in this book. Um, I don't know really what it tells us about commerce. It's it feels it felt right to have something in here that was, um, I suppose, my tribute to James Joyce, who is uh, one of the artists that has influenced me most. I have mistaken this for rubbish, although he's done very well to influence me, considering I've never read. I think you've mistaken this for art. Oh, one of his books all the way through, only sort of bits and pieces here and there. Destroy your art. Destroy your art is a... Uh, well, I was thinking about creation and the opposite of creation, which I suppose is destruction. You should take your own advice, mate. And I was wondering if such a thing existed as creative destruction. I mean, obviously, I had an idea that it might because of the various examples of uh, art throughout this, not least the um, burning of a million quid by uh, the K Foundation. You should take your own advice, mate. Just, yeah. Uh, but it, it came to me, which it should have done earlier really, because I'd studied the Communist Manifesto, that creative destruction is more commonly a term associated with communist theory. Destroyed. I've tried to weave together communist theory, art theory, and just kind of bits of fun and a bit of my own kind of approach to art in here. There are a lot of references to modern artists in this. It's almost like you've been trawling Wikipedia. Yeah, I was trawling Wikipedia. I mean, I'm usually trawling Wikipedia when I'm writing poems, if I'm honest. I struggle to think of a poem in this book that wasn't written with the aid of Wikipedia. There's uh, Michael Landy, Tracy Emin, Yuan Shai, Yuan Zhi. Don't make any money from this. Or Duchamp. Else. Is that Didier Duchamp? I do plan to uh, donate regularly to Wikipedia. So far I've only really contributed to it. Pierre Pinoncelli, uh, Pablo Picasso. Um, inserting untruths into both the Brown Sea Island uh, Wikipedia page and the Bill Oddie Wikipedia Uruberos. The same untruth actually into both. 
Karl Marx, is that Karl Marx or Groucho no, Marx? I won't go into the detail, but it has been removed. Uh, why Michael Landy? Why Breaking Down? Michael Landy is an artist that was uh, introduced to me, I think, by uh, uh, an artist that I also know called Hestia Pepe, and she suggested him as a, an alternative young British artist to the more famous uh, Damien Hirst, whom I might find interesting, and I did. And I can't remember whether I'd already heard of him, but certainly it, it was that that led me to... Um, uh, come across his work breaking down in which he destroyed all his possessions and put them all in bin bags and that was the art. At the end of this poem you say I'm Michael Landy breaking down. You're not though are you? You're Alexander Velke. And that appealed to me very much because at numerous times in my life uh, as evidenced by the last poem in this book Mistaken for Art or Rubbish I have felt the need to uh, sort of destroy a lot of my possessions on a whim. Alexander Belke breaking down, but I usually do it on a smaller scale, like I'll destroy all my, uh, all the old stuff in my fridge, for example, or in this case, all my art, all my paintings. Could you even drive when you wrote this poem? Does Michael Landy have a car? I think presumably he's got green flag or something. More than any other poem in the book, this could be t taken as didactic. Uh, I am, I do think it's important that people destroy their art, not all their art. Are you telling the reader to destroy your art? Not my art, sir. I think they'd be more than happy to. But uh, destruction can be very, very liberating. Nothing can be quite so liberating in art, I think, as destruction. Ill of the Dead. Ill of the Dead is a poem that uh, came to me, the idea came to me with the phrase and uh, with the very English and by extension British notion of celebrating the past and never speaking ill of the dead. Isn't this the same poem as alchemy? And this is not just literally dead people or recently dead people. I don't think you should go around saying uh, sod that bloke who's just died necessarily. Uh, but kind of about a conservative approach to uh, one's own or one's country's history as well. Or one's art's history. Nah, it's a bit... <laughs> the title is almost homophonous with Alice Cooper's song, I Love the Dead. Ill of the Dead. Ill of the Dead. I, I love, ill of, I love the dead. I love the dead. Say it quickly, say it quickly. I suppose it is. Uh, it's not meant to be anything to do with necrophilia or Alice Cooper. Ill of the dead, I love the dead, I love the dead, I love the dead, ill of the dead, I love the dead, ill of the dead, I love the dead, ill of the dead, I love the dead. Also, I love the dead would be the opposite meaning to what the poem has about the um, the, the narrator, who's a sculptor, wanting to be allowed not to celebrate the dead with his work, but to condemn and to uh, bemoan the dead, to moan about the dead. Um, did your grandfather beat your dad? I don't know if my grandfather beat my dad. Uh, did your bad dad, bad dad, bad dad? Probably not, he was probably too busy working. Did your dad beat smoking. you in turn? Did, is there a lot of violence in your family? How do you excuse the violent sexual imagery? Uh, but it's not about my father or my grandfather, the sculptor in the poem. As should be apparent, by that he is a sculptor. He's not me. The poem ends with a colon. Yeah, it does end with a colon. I'm glad you noticed that. That's very deliberate. Um, as do a lot of cancers these days. No, that wasn't a mistake. Uh, it ends with a colon. It says, a voice I recognised not at all spoke. Is what follows, what theoretically follows colon. after that colon. Uh, and then it, it's supposed to, I suppose, frustrate you, although whether anyone will care what the voice said by that point. It's not. It doesn't matter what, what follows after that colon what the voice said, or at least it doesn't matter that the voice has said something specific which I will tell to you. It simply matters that there is something missing at the end. Is what follows the next poem, is, is that what follows the colon? It's a conclusion without a conclusion, which I'm given to understand by my studies was a popular way of concluding, or not concluding, the 18th century. Is economics what follows the colon? Uh, you could say that what follows this is the next. Uh, it would kind of work because the message of the poem would fit very well with what might be said, but I don't want to say who's speaking after that colon. Who's speaking? Um, who's about to speak at the end of the poem? 
say it's uh, is it God, God or anything like. That? Is it Karl Marx? I d yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm not. Is it Michael Landon? Uh, I don't think. Uh, is I it don't... Pablo Picasso? Uh, no. Is it Rennie Sparks? Not necessarily. Is it Simon Turner? Could be. Is it Jay Wow? No. Well, I think I know what they'd say. Economics. Economics is a poem about how everything that ever happens everywhere is because uh, of money or of because exchange of goods. Uh, it, it's basically about how nothing is good or wholesome or morally uh, motivated. Everything is about money and shit. Not that I mean, everything is about money, comma, and shit. It says here there's no argument yet made that's not economic. I think that arguments against your poetry are economic. That's not, I mean, do I need to clarify that any further? I think the arguments against your poem are uneconomic. Everything is about money, and everything is shit. This poem's depressing. It is depressing, yeah, thanks. <laughs> it's kind of boring. It was meant to be. It's written in anachronistic language. I suppose it is. I suppose some of my poems, when they're not busy being, like, in the words of kind of failed songs, will be in kind of the words or the lexicon the language of uh, kind of failed, antiquated poems. It's like you sort of wanted it to be poem -y. I'm perfectly comfortable with that. Uh, people would say it's cliched or anachronistic. But you didn't really know how. But, hey, I think you have tools, you have ingredients, you know, you bake a cake, you use flour and... Egg, maybe? Which? How do you plead? Uh, you, you write a poem, you can... You know, put a word at the end, rearrange the sentence so that it rhymes. It's, people have been doing it for years. Is it really about art? So, uh, you know, do it if you want. Listen to people, you know. I capitalise every line of my poem. That's very unfashionable. When Sorry, it was about art, it'd be called art, wouldn't it? You know, I capitalise every uh, new line of all of my poems. That's very unfashionable. But, you know, sod, sod you if you think otherwise. I also, uh, as you'll see... I justify to the spine. And that was actually my designer, Zeph's decision. I used to uh, centrally align, which is very unfashionable, but now I've got this kind of meeting of, you know, is it unfashionable? Is it innovative? Not for me to say, but, um, you know, if I'm innovating, then uh, maybe, maybe Simon Turner should uh, pull his socks up. Is it really about art? It is about art. Uh, well, it's about commerce, so it's where the commerce meets the art, but it's, um, I think it, it could apply to art. Excuse me. It's not really poetry, is it? It's basically about how art is luxury, um, and that luxury has little place in economy. So, most art that actually happens, that you ever see, isn't really art, arguably. Because if it's intrinsically linked to the economy, how can it be art? I suppose it can be. Just draw your own conclusions. The crowning. I'm hot. A red eye clips and squid shedding a single brilliant tear. It's like you wanted to be poetic here, but you didn't know how. What's this one actually about? The Crowning is a poem that is not very long, and it really challenges the notion that short poems are better. Is this one about art? It's definitely the worst poem in the book. Is this about anything? But it is not completely worthless. It is a little bit kind of throwing images and ideas around to see what happens, what sticks. I don't know what it's about. And I wrote it. But even though it might have the appearance of a poem that was, you know, edited down by a vicious and uh, kind of modern uh, poetic hand. No, you wrote it. In the way that poets like uh, George Sertz's say you're supposed to with a poem, you're supposed to edit and edit and edit. I never do that. I just write it, and it's good. No, you wrote it. Does that make me a bad poet? Maybe. 
Does that make me a bad person? Maybe. Does that make me a rapist? No. Does it matter what a priceless work of art is framed? Uh, it doesn't matter what a priceless work of art is framed with. Well, well that's kind of the question that I'm asking, so I don't, I don't really want to answer my own questions. What's so good about gold? Obviously, saying a priceless work of art framed with gold, it's meant to uh, make you think, you know, if it's priceless, why, why give it gold? But obviously there's no such thing as priceless, is there? Is there? You wish your art was framed with gold. No, not in the art world, there's not. There's just really expensive stuff. That's different. I would prices. probably frame this with shit. Maybe in the museum world there's something. Nothing is priceless, everything is for sale. I would probably frame this with expanding foam. Everything has a price. I would probably frame this with violent sexual imagery. Certainly if you can ensure it. it has oh, come on. Sculptures of Nothing. Sculptures of Nothing uh, is a poem that was... It's, it's a lot of images and it's a lot of kind of fun. It's supposed to be fun. I was having fun writing it. It's inspired by the uh, episode of Stuart Lee's Comedy Vehicle in the first series where he talks about the global financial crisis and he ends the show by hanging off a balcony and talking about IKEA art and what it means about the society we live in. And I kind of took that idea and ran with it. I bet he's grateful. And then kind of tripped over with it and dropped it and broke it. And then kind of limped uh, through its remnants with bleeding feet for four pages. So pretty Is this whole people, set up, this conversation, is that inspired by the talking head slots on Comedy Video? No, it's, it's not. It's quite obviously, I'd have thought, inspired by the uh, Partridge on Partridge interview uh, sequence, which Alan Partridge conducts with himself during the Foster's sponsored comedy shorts uh, with co-starring Tim Key. Who's David Tibet? Uh, David Tibet is a man who sings and writes poems and things. He's, he, he's well known as the lead singer of the band Current 93. What is a sculpture of nothing? And a lot of his work is concerned with visions, his own very vivid and personal visions of the apocalypse often in his case influenced by kind of Christian uh, Christian mythology rather than kind of Ikea art or uh, kind of meaningless art, unartistic art, which is what I've tried to kind of mainly focus on in my vision of um, Is this poem itself a sculpture of nothing? Is this poem a sculpture of nothing? That's a very good question. Um, you are good with these questions. No. I don't think it is. I think it is a sculpture of something, but it's a sculpture of something that is bigger than it needs to be, and therefore unlikely to be bought by anyone. But I still think it qualifies as art, which um, a sculpture of nothing would not. However, a sculpture of nothing you could get in the right size and with the right kind of general artistic generic vibe to satisfy your aesthetic needs. This poem probably doesn't satisfy your aesthetic needs. Certainly doesn't satisfy. A forbidden mine. song of the dying west. Is it what? On the Jackie Leaven album called Forbidden Songs of the Dying West, uh, on the sleeve notes he explains the term, and he says it's almost like censorship. The example he gives is a man who spent his lifetime studying animals, a biologist, botanist, or something. And he was on Radio 4 and he said that uh, one of the great things that he loved about animals is they don't have wars, they don't kill one another, they don't use mustard gas. And uh, when the slot was repeated later on Radio 4 they took out the reference to mustard gas. And Jackie Leaven called that a forbidden song of the dying west. So is this poem a forbidden song of the dying west? Um, no then, it's not a forbidden song of the dying west, except in that in both of the reviews of my book, this poem was not mentioned. But then most of the poems were not mentioned in the reviews of my books because there are 33 poems in this book and that would have taken quite a long time. Also, this poem doesn't have the word cock in it and uh, both of my reviewers were quite keen on the word cock, probably because they're men. Have you ever self-censored? In, in real life, I self-censored all the time. You know, I do self-censor, but um, in my art, I have never self-censored 
except for do you think the work would be better if you did this more often no or more editing i don't think it would be better it would be shorter uh but it wouldn't be any better it would still be as good or as bad might even be worse yeah, cutting out some uh, some of the meat you don't want to cut out the meat unless you're allergic to it or opposed to the production of it on moral ground. Doubtless. What's this Doubtless. Uh, hmm. Uh, another another self harm reference here. How do you excuse all the violent sexual imagery? I suppose it's about doubting doubt. Or possibly doubting the doubt of doubt. Uh, yeah, no, I can't actually. Yeah. Sorry. It's definitely about some sort of angst. What's happening at the end here? That bit about hats. What's about right, hats? Um, well, I'm wearing a hat now, as you can see. Well, I'm not. I'm not wearing a hat now. I was wearing a hat. hat I was I wearing a hat. All to wear appropriate hats to any given event. All being well, that would be the moment. Okay. The thing is about hats, like boxes, they are uh, quite clear and powerful metaphors because you know you wear different hats I'm wearing my uh, mum hat I'm wearing my uh, regional manager of uh, a branch of Staples hat so it sounds good but it doesn't really mean anything I'm wearing my grand vizier of the high church of Pembrokeshire hat you know I don't these aren't real hats that I have this this is a real hat you can tell because look you can touch it so, uh, but hats work as metaphors, so you know, one needs metaphorical hats for different events, be they real or metaphorical events, and it would even help if one had real hats. So yeah, that's what that poem is about. Finally, Christ! Finally, mistaken for art or rubbish. The uh, eponymous poem, if you Mistaken know. for art or rubbish is a poem that is autobiographical about the time I moved in with my uh, wife, who was not my wife then, but is now. And I had all these kind of piles of paintings that I've been carrying around for a long time. And I, I had grown very sick of them. And I didn't want to put them underneath another bed, or behind another piano, or even upon another wall. And I just thought, I'll throw them out. And so I did that. Not all of them, uh, but most of them. And then I went to work and I wrote this poem about it. In the first line, art is in inverted commas. Who are you quoting? Quoting me, uh, because I called them art. I suppose really I should call them paintings and collages, but art was shorter. They had one syllable. Why did you throw away your paintings? I threw them away because they weren't very good. Um, not necessarily technically good, I just felt they were suffering from a poverty of ambition. The poetry then, is it art or is it rubbish? Obviously it's both. Uh, it is art, so you can't say it's not art. Certainly you can't say it's not art just because you don't like it. Uh, you can't say it's not art because it's not painting. Um, and you can't say it's not art because... I don't know, because not many copies have sold or because it hasn't been written about sufficiently in uh, sufficiently reputable publishers uh, and and then it is rubbish as well it is rubbish because it is literally landfill it is a solid object that has no real practical purpose and uh, you know to many people it is the critics seem to think it was more rubbish than art yeah the critics did seem to think it was more rubbish than art and they were relatively kind in not making full use of that pun the obvious pun they were not so kind in uh, not making use of the obvious pun in the subtitle has doubts. I mean, if something is that obvious, it's like, oh, I also have doubts, I mean, just don't, don't go there. Make up something else, you know. Uh, but they were wrong, and uh, I'll tell you why they were wrong. They weren't just wrong because they didn't praise it, or because they, uh, you know, didn't agree with my opinion of it. They were wrong in their critiques because both focused on my press releases, criticisms of the modern poetry. 
Sí. So that's the end. No more. Um, a few questions now that have come in through the Facebook page. Paid you, for example. 